Hello and welcome to Oakville Matters. Today, the thing that matters, I think, most to Oakville residents is the affordability of new housing, or perhaps the affordability of all housing. But let's talk about new housing because it's something that we might actually be able to do something about. Joining me today to delve into this topic for you is uh, Gabe Charles, who's the planning director for the town of Oakville, Kirk Bigger, who's our senior planner, and Brad Sunderland, who's our policy planner. And by planner, we mean the people who help council decide what rules will be in place for what you can build and where you can build it and all those lovely ideas. So um, uh, Brad just did a study, uh, a big report for council that's on council's website that sort of triggered this. And, uh, uh, and when, we, when we start at the very top, Brad, uh, what's the first thing we notice? Uh, what's Canada got to do with our affordable housing situation? So, uh, right. Uh, so the, the national housing strategy is really what uh, kicks off um, housing in Canada. And under the national housing strategy, there's a number of programs there which uh, speak to funding for various programs um, and and what the provinces as well as uh, regional governments can take advantage of to help uh, put in place more affordable housing uh, and housing programs. And so we see that as well uh, reflected in the recent uh, federal budget that was released um, and, and that housing has become clearly a national issue that uh, requires some uh, substantial focus uh, to address the affordability across the nation. So. Um, we're looking at how some of that funding might trickle down uh, and influence uh, how we might uh, go about doing our planning here and taking advantage of some of that. So when Canada talks about housing affordability, are they talking about the affordability of all kinds of housing? Is there a, just a segment of the, of the market that, that they're concerned with? Or do they only, or, or does, for all I know, does Canada only concern itself with what we used to think of as social housing or, or subsidized housing? So I think it's a cross section, but I know um, one of the key focus areas, um, they're looking at housing for young people and younger populations to get into the housing market uh, and, and how that might, uh, what programs they can put in place to really encourage that. So that was one of the key areas where they put a lot of emphasis on, um, but they do look beyond that as well in terms of modernizing some of our existing community housing uh, that exists today and how to maintain affordability in some of these uh, and even maintenance in some of these existing uh, uh, buildings and developments. So there's a big cross section, uh, but I will say, yeah, again, one of the key focuses is uh, housing for young people. All right. So in theory, that's um, some kind of market housing then or starter housing even. I, I'd be, uh, I might, uh, I might astonish some people if I told you the, the house that my mother and dad uh, started out in with five kids, uh, 900 square feet, three tiny bedrooms, and uh, that's how my two brothers and I learned to love a triple bunk bed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I remember asking my dad, "How come we don't have a closet?" He said, "Well, you don't have enough clothes for a closet yet." Those are the days, eh? So now, uh, the, the recent problems in affordability in Halton seems to have started two and a half years ago, uh, approximately. I say that because in Halton, the, the Burlington, Halton Hills, Milton, Oakville uh, constituents of Halton, we, uh, we're all part of a plan that says 30% of new housing has to be affordable. And affordable is defined as housing that the average person can handle without spending more than 30% of their income, right? And uh, as, as, as uh, recently as two and a half, three years ago, I think, uh, let's see, the best statistic I saw in, in all of the reports that Halton puts out is that uh, on average over the last five years, we met that target. But we know that in the last two years uh, of report, 21 and 20, we didn't meet it. So we must have met it really good the, the previous uh, three years. So uh, as planners and uh, people who have to look ahead into the future, 
uh, Gabe and Kirk and Brad, uh, when you see headlines following the rate increase that the Bank of Canada put in, where home prices are falling now, do you step back and wonder, well, do we need to do more? And if we do more, would it be too much? Uh, what's your thinking on that? How do you know when, you, when, when, when the problem's fixed? I, I think that's, that's a really interesting question uh, in terms of when it's fixed. Because through, through our work with, with the region, what we are really trying to do is, is enable uh, a full spectrum of housing opportunities across Oakville and, and ensuring that we are growing in the right locations. As council uh, had worked with, with us uh, a couple of years ago and the council's credit established an urban structure, which really identified here's our series of, of centers and corridors where we are going to uh, promote uh, and enable other forms of, of housing, whether it's uh, mid-rise or tall buildings. And throughout North Oakville, we have a fair cross-section of different housing types. And that allows us to uh, to provide through through the development industry and working with them to provide that full spectrum of housing. And by being able to provide that that additional choice, then we're able to uh, to then ensure that um, we're accounting for for that affordability that, that the region has has identified. So I, I don't know that's necessarily any one thing in terms of trying to achieve that. It's trying to ensure that we're, we're working with with both the industry and with the region to to offer that uh, the, the product. Well, I know in the 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 regional state of housing report, which we do every year, one of the points that jumps out at me is that a lot of the success with affordability uh, has come by, uh, I don't know whether to say it's preferring or requiring uh, a, uh, a larger component of apartments and, and uh, townhouses, let's call it, uh, than single family homes. Like 50, I think uh, the region's been preferring or requiring 50% of that denser style uh, in order to get the average uh, to come in correctly. And uh, so is part of our future, uh, well, I, I actually am an optimist about affordability, is, is, is part of the uh, solution, our shift towards uh, denser forms of housing I would uh, I would agree with that statement, and that's certainly where our planning is leading us, Mayor Burton. Uh, we, we at the local level have a control over supply to a certain extent, and that's where we've really been focused. And broadening that range and mix through the development within Oakville, uh, in our green fields, but also within our urban structure and supporting transit with transit-oriented development. So those all those types of measures help to connect to affordability as well. If you don't have to take a car everywhere, then you might have more income for housing or for groceries. Uh, so, so denser and in the right locations is definitely where we're aiming with our planning work. Well, I, I, in conversations with some builders, I learned that the over over the last twenty years, um, many of the parts of the cost of a house have gone up. Uh, all of the parts of the cost of a house have gone up, but many of them have uh, gone up in, let me call it a plausible kind of way. Uh, you know, maybe a component has doubled, but the price of land, the cost of the land has gone up like many, many fold, tenfold, a hundredfold. Uh, and so uh, the biggest component of our, our affordability problem is the value of land. Um, and of course, the only solution there is to put as many units as possible on a given piece of land. And so if you want an affordable housing unit, I guess you, you're kind of, we're gonna be shifting to an even bigger mix of uh, density, I would think, just to make, just to make stuff affordable. Um, and as planners, do we have any idea what has driven the price of land to go so high in the stratosphere? It's interesting that, that you asked that because the for, for the Oakville's Greenfield situation is north of Dundas, and the vast majority of those lands have already been in ownership for for decades. And so, the, from from uh, from a value perspective, I don't know how the value has has gone up the way it has, 
certainly as lands become serviced, they, they may have a little bit more value, but in terms of the exponential increase, that one I think is a little bit harder to, uh, to, to, to put a finger on, unless it's just simply coming down to, to the demand of, of wanting to, to build and, and as soon as possible. But, but to your point earlier, that, that's why when we do have areas identified for intensification, we're trying to do what we can to ensure that we're maximizing that, that density, which then helps break down that, that overall cost and does make those units uh, more affordable. So Trafalgar Road being a key example uh, in North Oakville, where we're trying to ensure that we have uh, the right form of development there that we are sure that is dense enough because the balance of North Oak, where we have a fairly good cross section in terms of, of housing types and, and typologies that are out there and product for, for the public to, to choose from. So ensuring that along Trafalgar Road, which is intended to be a future bus rapid transit corridor, that we're putting in the right amount of density there to support that infrastructure. All right, so um, the other tool that, that affordability, uh, uh, that we, there's another tool that we, that we haven't figured out how to use yet. In 2016, the province passed the uh, Affordable Housing Act, and they they put a bunch of policies into the Planning Act that really amount to two. I describe them as uh, you now have the power to invent a policy to require affordable housing, um, and then there's the usual provincial, uh, let me call it safeguards and tests that you got to meet in order to actually use it. And, uh, and here's another power, which is the power, if, if you can figure out the policy to make it happen, uh, to require affordable housing to stay affordable for uh, a set number of years, you get to pick. So in both cases, uh, I'm trying to simplify it down to, here's a power to create a policy, if you can think of one, to require affordability and to keep it affordable. And, uh, and we've had you know five, six years now to uh, think about that. Has anybody come up with uh, these policies or, or is it uh, one of those things where uh, nobody's, nobody's figured that out yet? Because that, that, I thought those were the most peculiar powers. It's like a non-power power if you, if you see what I'm trying to say. So what's happening out there? Uh, uh, among the, you know, out there in the experimental lab that all the different cities constitute, what have people done with this? So <clears throat> to begin, I guess, scratching the surface of this is it's, so it's an inclusionary zoning is the tool that's offered through the Planning Act for us to take advantage of. Uh, and it does allow for municipalities to look at um, the inclusion of affordable housing units within a development. Uh, that contains other residential units and that we can maintain that affordability over a set period of time. So um, one of the requirements uh, before we can, you know, put that type of uh, requirement in place or impose that requirement onto a development is that we have to do a, an assessment report um, across, the, across the town to understand, you know, how that might work. Uh, and that would inform our our policies, which would ultimately end up in our official plan that you know guide growth and change, uh, and then and it would get implemented through our zoning bylaw, uh, zoning bylaw through zoning bylaw amendments as they come forward and, and development proceeds. Um, so, as you mentioned, the tool was uh, available in 2016. Uh, it has um, had some changes to it even since that time in the Planning Act, where we are we are able to look at how how and where this tool might be used. Originally, it was, you know, it could have been townwide, and now we're looking at in areas identified as protected major transit station areas, which is around the Bronte Go station, uh, which we recently um, brought an official plan amendment forward for a new plan there, as well as Midtown Oakville, which is around the Oakville Go train station. Uh, and so those are the two key areas where we might be able to look at using this tool uh, going forward. Uh, and you're right, it is a very new tool to Ontario. Um, and as far as I understand, the only municipality that has put a framework in place to date is the city of Toronto, uh, given their development pressures and you know many protected major transit station areas uh, there. Um, but you know, looking at best practices is still uh, something that the town will be doing. I know our, our friends at the city of Burlington are looking at, uh, at this uh, quite keenly. Um, and you know, they're taking, um, taking um, 
best practice examples from the United States, where inclusionary zoning has a bit more of a, a long history there, uh, and and the you know the benefits and setbacks about how they've they've rolled out their program. So um, I think it's still a, a learning curve for us for sure, but uh, we're we're looking forward to you know um, to undertaking these assessment reports to to potentially put in that policy framework to, to guide how that's going to work for us. So uh, uh, Oakville solution is required, but um, I think we'll, we'll be able to get there. I've been following the city of Toronto's work on inclusionary zoning, and I've been struck by how slowly they've gone, how extensively they've consulted with the builders who after all have to agree to build the stuff. And, um, and how, I mean, I don't think they've actually uh, created a single inclusionary zoning unit yet. I mean, they're really, we're talking about only the last report I said, they were, you know, just passing uh, some of their rules. And, uh, and that tells me if the city of Toronto is going slow, this is a, this is probably a scary area of regulation and policy. Uh, and I know when this, when this came out, uh, you know, back uh, six, seven years ago, I was hauled in front of a bear pit by the local home builders association with the other mayors in Halton. And they demanded to know if I was for or against inclusionary zoning. And it was so new that uh, I knew what I thought about it, which was, I thought it was probably a good idea, uh, but something told me I should, I should ask a question before I answer the question. So I asked them, well, before I tell you what I think of it, you tell me what you think it is. And none of them could define it. Uh, and uh, so there was this one person in the audience whose definition of it was, well, now the cities have the power to make us only build affordable housing or you know, up to 100% of our housing has to be affordable. And that'll wreck our business. And I said, well, I like the word up to, I think that means that there's a middle ground somewhere where we get affordable housing and we don't wreck your business. Uh, and they said, well, we're against it anyway. So uh, it wasn't a surprise to me when a couple of years ago, what, or was it last, was it Bill 109 that, that restricted inclusionary zoning to uh, only the protected transit areas? Was it 108 or 109? Anyway, it was the, this, this uh, for the moment, current government that, that brought that in. Um, so, uh, uh, and, the, and the context six, seven years ago was we were getting enough affordability that th this was not an issue. You know, every two years we, uh, we survey the residents and ask, you know, what's the biggest issue? And uh, affordable housing didn't used to get mentioned. Uh, last time we did this survey uh, earlier this year, that was number one. So uh, uh, I guess it's timely. Uh, now, what happens if uh, what happens if uh, if we uh, enact inclusionary zoning and nobody builds anything? Is, is that something to worry about? Kirk, you've got a smile that says you've got an answer. Well, I'll, I'll try and give an answer, Mayor Burton. I think that uh, it's a, it is a new power, and we're treading lightly with its use. Um, part of the delay or the slowness in adopting the power is, um, as was pointed out, the shifting landscape of regulation in the province. But in our official plan review, we're going to wrap it all up. And I imagine inclusionary zoning will be a part of it uh, in certain locations. And that we will, we will take the best practices and the experiences of our neighbors and our colleagues and, and try to use those in Oakville context. Uh, I imagine that it will require a willing developer to engage in that kind of conversation and to try and develop in, in that fashion. Uh, but I think it's a new power and we, sh we should certainly be trying, trying to use it. Well, I know that, uh, I know all the members of Halton Council from serving with them for so long and Oakville Council, obviously I would know our local councilors as well. And I can't think of a counselor who's against uh, using this tool. We just wanna make sure we use it well and, and that we don't, you know, the, the, the big danger with a lot of new stuff is the inadvertent, unexpected, adverse consequence. You know, you, you think you're doing good and something bad happens. 
And if the bad is bigger than the good, well, then it's really bad. So mm -hmm. a little bit of caution uh, is always a good idea. Now, uh, another thing that people talk about in the context of, of housing affordability is, well, you've got to get more supply. And uh, the, the question in my mind is, given the doubling of immigration uh, I'm, and the, you know, we've got supply chain problems, we've got labor shortages, we've got uh, shortage of cement and steel and wood and nails and brads. Uh, uh, increasing supply strikes me as uh, easier to say than to do. Uh, what's, our, uh, what's our sense in Oakville of pent up, uh, well, I guess the first place to look is how many houses have, or housing units have we approved but not yet been built because of all the staging requirements that, that a builder has to go through? Uh, the last time I checked, it was thousands. Are we, uh, have we, have our builders eaten through the backlog of approvals? Yeah, there tends to be uh, some ebbs and flows in terms of when approvals are, are completed and then you, you get into the actual housing construction. And for the most part, uh, the builders generally are trying to get product to market as fast as possible, but you're quite right with the labor shortage, et cetera, and supply chain issues, it, it becomes more challenging uh, on that. The, the number of delays I hear from, from people and, and asking why aren't we finding ways to, to help accelerate that? Well, we can only do what we can do in, in terms of getting the units um, available in terms of, of approvals. And then it goes over to, to the builders to, to bring those to market. Yeah. And that, that's on, on certainly on, on the, the, the grade related product on the, the taller forms of development, those those take years to, to get people into them, J just simply from a financing perspective and how long it takes to, to build these buildings, which can be two years plus just to build. So you'll have people who are um, in the queue for, for 30, 36 months and more in, in some cases. Uh, so what, what we certainly try to do in, in terms of trying to accelerate that is we're always looking at our development processes to ensure that they're not just transparent, but they're easy to navigate, uh, not just for, for the big builders, but for, for the, the small builders uh, as well. And so by, by trying to, to ensure that we're doing that all the way from inception to occupancy, that we're making that process as easy as possible on not just the planning side, but also on, on the building side and, and the number of improvements that our building department is making to try to make that process easier. We're doing certainly what we can in terms of uh, getting make, making the process easier for, for those who are trying to deliver on the supply side. Right. Now, uh, when the Housing Affordability Task Force reported, uh, well, first, the Housing Affordability Task Force had no experienced expert municipal voices at the table. So I wasn't surprised when, uh, when we mayors shocked them by reporting, hey, there's a quarter million approved and unbuilt housing units in the GTHA. And so, you know, I don't know, we, we said, how is it going to change the supply of housing, you know, if, if we speed up our approvals by a day or a month or, or even a year, uh, and they go into this queue that people sit on, uh, you know, how's that, how's that helping anybody? And, and isn't that just cheating the public? Because you guys, the professionals who are supposed to look at these applications, are being robbed of the time you need to make sure that it's a good, uh, that it's a good application. And uh, that's got to be a frustration for you. Uh, you know, tell me that you like it, but uh, I don't think you do. Well, and the challenge from from our perspective and any municipality that you talk to is we will do everything that we can to get comments back out to, to an applicant. And, and it is often a cordial relationship to work through the, these, these, these projects. But that said, even if we get comments back out to, to a developer, there's, it's not as if the clock suddenly stops. We have to wait for them to then reply to us. So sometimes there can be quite the lag in between when comments are provided and we're waiting for resubmissions, et cetera. So when projects take two plus years to complete, that's not because municipal staff or agency staff have been sitting on it. It's because there's been a lot of back and forth. That, to your point, we have to go through to get to a point where staff are in a position where we're comfortable to provide a recommendation to our councils. Yeah, I know of, I know of a case where... Uh... I think the, the application has been in the queue for two years. And uh, 
And it's entirely the applicant's uh, choice to work at the slow pace that he's working at. I know of a subdivision in North Oakville where the builder, uh, he built the, the easy stuff first and then stopped building that subdivision and has left it uh, half finished and has moved over to the to another part of Oakville to do to start another subdivision and only has the resources to do one of those at a time. And so in a way, he's going around uh, pulling the low hanging fruit off the tree, doing the fast stuff and then leaving, you know, you pointed out that the denser stuff takes longer, but he's leaving it. And, uh, and there you go, there's, there's uh, uh, two really good examples of how come there's more than a quarter million units uh, approved and, and not being built. So, uh, no, uh, the last point I think we could try to cover in the minute we've got left is uh, there are still a lot of people in Oakville who would like to see us seal the border and uh, not let anybody in. And uh, what I've learned over the last 16 years is in Ontario, you're never allowed to say you're full because the sky's the limit is pretty much the way Ontario seems to, seems to look at it. Uh, I met a man the other day who was mad at me because uh, we were growing. And I asked him when he got here and he said it was 10 years ago. And I said, well, gee, I got here 30 years ago. And if I had been able to shut the door behind me, you wouldn't have got here. Well, well you know, he goes, well, it's, I want the door shut now. <laughs> like, well, gosh, the town of Oakville is the bottom of a four layer cake of government, Canada, Ontario, Halton, Oakville. We are not the guys with the uh, power to shut the door. Um, so listen, thank you very much for this. Uh, there's clearly a lot more to this story that, uh, than you can cover in, in only 27 minutes. And, uh, and we do cover it at Planning and Development Council a lot. So uh, to the public, uh, thanks for watching. When you're, when you're hungry for more information about this, come to Planning and Development Council and ask questions. We, as you can see, are eager and happy to provide you with the answers. Thanks very much for being with us. See you next time.